Um, our next guest tonight, um, our final guest for the night, is Nick Heineman, who Myrtle and I have known for many, many years in many guises. But at this point, he runs the Afristar Foundation, uh, a permaculture foundation, and he's very, very involved in cannabis legalization in South Africa for, for years and years in the background. He's a brilliant lobbyist. He's got, um, he's got the gift of the gab towards Parliament, and he's written an op-ed piece, an opinionista in the Daily Maverick, which got published this week about this gap that it's possible that cannabis might have in a post-COVID world. At world. So um, I don't know whether you've read, have, have any of you read the article? It's quite a thing. I actually was really cool with headphones on. You 13 minute listen and you can listen to how Nick crafted this thing. And he's looking to a future of sustainable cannabis just like he has been all of his life. But he sees it as a bit of a gap now. So are you there, Nick? Are you online at the moment? Yes, yes. Good evening, everyone. Hey, Nick. Good evening. to see you. Hey, Nick. How's it going? Right. Yeah, good. I've really, none of you guys read the article, except for Jules. Uh, no, they're probably reading it now and catching up. You know, they can speed read. Sorry, I shouldn't have put them all in the position <laughs> of saying no. They could have just nodded safely. Uh, <coughs> it's all good. It's all good. Nick, Thank uh, you for having me on the show, and good evening to everyone. Nick, it's um, it's really, it's, it's, we were trying to put it into words as well, what you did put into words. We're a little bit brain dead on the content. We've got we've got the ground a little bit apart from the odd post. So to see you having so many words actually published in like what we consider a really great order, and it was a really well crafted thing. You touched on many many things. How have you? Are you? How's the the response to the article been? You know, on Facebook, I think, and LinkedIn, there's been a fairly positive response. It, it needs to get out there more, guys. So I mean, I'm, that's why I'm joking when I say, have you read it? But um, it's sort of the culmination of 20 years work and with this COVID thing going on, I was very much like, you know, how can I make an effort and, and how can I contribute the best way I can? And so, you know, we, we also have a full-time lobbyist in parliament and, um, we were talking with him and sort of in the, in all these discussions, the sort of framework for this came out. So I thought, well, let me just write it. So I wrote it and then somebody helped connect me into the media and um, and uh, we got it published, which was excellent. First time I actually managed to get something published. Um, and we're really just trying to, you know, for the first part of this year with our new lobbyist in parliament, it's, we realized that people don't know much about numbers. Uh, I'm talking about parliamentarians, you know, they know about DACA and things like that. But when you actually get into the nuts and bolts, they really don't know a whole lot. So we've got this uh, hemp bioplastics briefcase, not briefcase, but it's a rolling suitcase that uh, uh, Paul takes around to Parliament with him and you can say to these guys, hey, look, this, this is made out of uh, Dacha plastic and, you know, you open it up and it's like Tony's briefcase, the whole value chain is there, the, the fiber and the canvas and the papers and the plastic stuff, it's all there and you can start telling an amazing story and no one really knows about it. Uh, so the emphasis has been on education, but I think with this crisis, the, we needed more. We needed like a sort of a shock or, or, or some statement that we can say like, uh, this plant can create X amount of jobs over X amount of hectares. And uh, that's why we need to give it attention. And, and that's what I set out to do with it. That's the first time we've really been able to quantify in figures I noticed. Uh, how many jobs. Sorry, carry on. Sorry, I shouldn't have distracted you there. I noticed that there was some pretty, some pretty hard and fast figures in the article. I was going to ask you about that. Is that. Have they changed in the last four weeks of lockdown? Is that actually, is it possible to actually project anything at this point? How, how confident you are you of those figures? Because it's quite a bold move putting some figures out there like that. <laughs> you know, uh, Tony set out doing this a couple, about a year and a half ago. He put some figures down and uh, where we figured different things for different amounts for stalk, different amounts for um, seed and uh, different amounts for cannabinoids. It was way, way higher. We, our figure, our real figure, if you farm it properly, is probably closer to 500,000 rand potentially per hectare. Wow. 
So, and I just took an average figure. Um, but it depends what figures we're talking about. So, uh, for a while now, the last year and a half, I've sort of looked at the Zimbabwe model of uh, small scale farmers. And anyone who knows much about Zimbabwe will know that there was that uh, uh, redistribution of land, and a lot of the big farmers, commercial farmers, lost their land. And uh, the tobacco, in particular, out output in uh, Zimbabwe plummeted. And 10 years later, what you've seen is that you've got hundreds of thousands of small scale farmers that are producing as much tobacco today as those big commercial farmers used to produce. So it's actually a bit of a success story. And so I was looking at that and thinking, well, that's what we need to do with cannabis. You know, we've got a couple of, I don't know how many, we don't know how many farmers there are, but let's just say there's 100,000 of them. And let's say they each have two hectares that they can farm. So then that's one farmer, and, and then he's probably going to employ two laborers per two hectares. So if you can have um, 20,000 hectares, you produce, you've got 30,000 jobs. So that's a 20,000 hectare farm. That's tiny. I mean, it's a big farm. But if you consider that there's 3.6 million hectares under maize, just 10 of these hubs is like 6% of the maize crop, and we're going to employ um, 300,000 yeah. workers right so the numbers are there i think we've we've we conservative with our numbers that's what i that's uh, what the anything. article implied it's great it's actually it's brilliant news i'm really glad that there is a go-to place that we can send people to to say oh no it's their figures but it's a great thing to be able to do to yeah. to get to the basis of quantifying this and the other thing that you obviously at the bottom of the list of everything in your article was the fact that it is dachy it's a, this is an industrial product this is a way, and even seed, just the fact that you can eat the seed, because out there soon the people are going to be starving, they're going to need something to eat. So you, 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 you dress these very, very salient points, and it's a timely thing. So it's a great, it's, a, it's an impact article, and I'll help you get it out, no problem. And I mean, that's excellent. I think everyone needs to try, because I, I think this, this COVID-19 is a real opportunity for us to bring in something new, you know, without just collapsing into uh, conspiracy theories and all these things. It really is an opportunity, and we're going to need to create jobs, and I don't know anything that can create jobs like the potential of this plant and whole new value chains. Uh, you know, and then we tried, the next step was to say, okay, well, how much value is there, you know, besides just creating jobs? What's that, what's that plant worth in the ground? And, uh, so, and there we got to some figures. Uh, CBD obviously makes it a lot worth a lot more. And, and the more CBD you produce, the lower the price of the CBD is going to become over time. So, uh, but we reckon that one, one hub would produce over 20,000 hectares would be worth about 3.5 billion. Yeah. So, so that, 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 would, that, that, that is a lot of money. I mean, we're talking about 350,000 rand going into the hands of a small farmer on two hectares of land. Now, you imagine how that's going to change the social dynamics in Cisco, Transkai, Venda, uh, KwaZulu Natal. You know, it, the, you, you actually can't even quantify that. It's, yeah. it's unprecedented in our history. And so, uh, as you mentioned earlier, Jules, we, I'm also uh, a run a permaculture NGO. So, Central to that is we, you know, we wanting to bring in food security, wanting to bring in ecological right. planning so that it's not just one arbitrary crop that's planted, yes. you know, on the wrong way on the slope and the water's still running away and we've still got deforestation. We want to bring long-term ecological security so that when these things happen to us, again, we don't have these huge shocks. We don't have the whole economy falling down because it doesn't have to be like that. It's like that because of the way we've created things. So, right, indeed. Uh, you know, it, you, what, it, it's really carry on. Well, one of the one of the cool things about the article was it started off um, very early on making the distinction about local land races and how they are endemic and how they're bulletproof and how it is actually the only thing that's going to work quickly. So that was cool as well in that article to make people realize that they're sitting on a gold mine and we don't need a genetic from somewhere else for 10 uh, years of trials plant. and heaven knows what to find a cultivar. Yeah. Local plant, local land, yeah. local labor. Uh, you know, we've been through a very fairly diligent consultative process 
in terms of coming up with what our policy is in Parliament. It can't just be a bunch of people thinking what's best, you know. Free so, the weed, free the um, weed. Our chairperson, I mean, when I say about this, I'm talking about the Cannabis Development Council and sort of especially the Western Cape uh, part of that. And uh, that's, that's what's come out very strongly, is that we, we need to support the existing farmers and we need to... Um, we need to use our existing land race genetics. I think 20 years ago, when we started this lobbying process, uh, things could have been different and we could have gone a different route. But we didn't go that route. Government had every opportunity to do it. They haven't. So we, we can't now take another 10 years to develop genetics and, and go down that route. We, we need to empower people right now with exactly. what we've got. And uh, it's super exciting for me. And, you know, I was on this NOCO hemp uh, summit last night and the, in America, they're talking about the same thing. You know, it looks like they're going to take their, their their CBD percentage up to 1%, hopefully this year, because it's got nominal THC at 1%. But there, the activists are saying the same thing. This is ridiculous. Let's regulate at, at end use, you know, rather than regulate in the field where things are getting hot and exactly. or your crop's getting hot and has to get destroyed. It's just, it's... That's a, it's a fun, that's a fundamental thing. There's a, there's a point here from uh, Ras Warren. Um, the, 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 the per hectare um, uh, figures that you were laying down, which sector of the industry do you think would produce more jobs and revenue, excuse me, revenue, industrial or recreational cannabis? Do, do, you, do, you, do you think there will be a tipping point where industry is going to be worth much more than um, dime bankies? Where do you see that going? Do you think, uh, sorry, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll add it. I'll it's add. an interesting one, you know, because if you look at Pondoland, if you look at Pondoland and there you, you're paying three, four hundred rand a kilo, I'm pretty confident that the industrial value of that is higher than the current recreational value of. Okay. But if we go into a high value CBD crop that's sitting in a field, uh, obviously that crop is, is worth a lot more. Uh, so it really depends. That's why the emphasis must be that our land race genetics should be the cornerstone of, um, of the industrial crop because the farmers who are there are marginalized by the current recreational space. And mm -hmm. unless we can upskill them, but the chances then of upskilling them, you, this is what the strain hunters have, have battled with from what I've understood all along is that if you go and give um, sort of high tech new seed species to these traditional growers that have grown land races, you're going to lose the land race. You won't really because the land race is fairly strong and tends to cross and cross and cross and will be dominant, but you do lose the purity of what that land race is. So how do we maintain that land race and put it to work and utilize it? It, it seems that that should be the cornerstone of the, for me. And I'm not saying I know everything, I really don't. It's, it's just the summary of where we are right now is that uh, it, it seems that it's most effective to use our land races as the cornerstone of industrial crop. Well, um, you know, I don't think that one or the other is going to create more jobs per hectare. I think it's probably fairly similar. Okay. It depends. Um, if, you, if you're processing by hand and hand rating on the industrial side, which is highly unlikely uh, in the modern world, then, then industrial would create more jobs. But I think it's, it's all going to be about the same, two or three jobs per hectare. <laughs>